Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvelously well. Sitting here with the rather wonderful Bruce Robb. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Thanks for giving us the, uh, the studio tour, which will have aired before this. Oh, I've been looking forward to this, man. It's, I'm, like I say, I was surprised we haven't met before. I, I, we probably have, we just didn't realize it. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, uh, Cherokee um, on Fairfax was you know, an institution for many decades, a couple yeah, of decades? Yeah, three. Three decades. three decades. 33 years, I think. Um, but let's find out a little bit more about your past, because... You were in a band with your brothers. There was yeah. three of you. Yeah, three of us and our, and our drummer, who we became an adopted cousin because <clears throat> Dick Clark liked that better. <laughs> so, so how did all that start? How did you, oh and how old were you? It started, we, we lived in a very small town in Wisconsin. That, that if, you know, it would be 1,950 people, and you drive in, and it say 1,951, and it would be, oh, Mrs. Johnson had her baby, and it was that kind of place. So. We were kind of our own best friends. There weren't a lot of people out there and everything. And uh, we played. We played a lot. We had a, we, there was a boathouse that we'd go and play and it had a piano. And uh, it was a great source of entertainment to us. And as kids, you wanted to get away from your parents and that was really cool. And then the other kids would know, come over and sit and watch us. So we did that and uh, formed a band. My big brother formed a band. And uh, Joe, the middle brother, joined it before I did because I wasn't quite tall enough to really see over the organ at that point, really. <laughs> and uh, about a year and a half later, I joined the band when I was 13. And we we practiced a lot and we were pretty good. We sang three-part harmony and stuff and played. And uh, we went around playing the local circuits up in Wisconsin and Michigan and Illinois. And uh, there was a kind of a where a, a little, not arenas, but little uh, almost like ice skating rinks and things that you'd go play in these barns. So the Dick Clark Summer Caravan of Stars would came along and they get one local band that could play. So we were the local band, we got the gig there. And uh, we finish our show, and then it starts with all the stars and everything. And uh, somebody comes out, and Dick Clark was with the tour. He didn't usually come, but he was with him that year. And he said that Mr. Clark would like to see you in the dressing room. And we go, ooh, cool. And so we meet him, and it was, he was wonderful. He was like, who are you kids? You're, you're children. It's like, what? How old were you at the time? I was probably 14 or 15 at that point on it. And uh, it was, you know, every... It, it back then nobody was checking IDs so we could play and these were beer bars and things and you know it's like okay we'd sneak me in the back door and uh we go and talk to him and he's you know questioning us and said well you guys play like you've been a band for a while and you know he said well we sort of have and everything so he said how'd you like to join the summer caravan so we thought wow and he said you can come on and play you know, a half hour show, your show. And then for the acts that don't have a band, you'll you'll be their band. And so we were Jerry Lee Lewis's backup band and the Everly Brothers and Dion and oh, the list goes on forever. And that. Are you you the middle brother? Youngest. The youngest brother. Yeah. And how old were your other brothers? Uh Joe, my next brother up, is uh thirteen months older than I am and D was five years. We all went to the same school. And I'm looking out the window in class one day, and I see the two brothers walk by, and my older brother goes, and so I teach her, give her to the bathroom. And so I go out and say, what's going on? And he said, if we can get to New York in 48 hours, we can join the first Cliff Ridges and Dave Clark Five Tour. And we're going, oh boy, oh boy, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's go. And that was it. That was pretty much it. And we, you know, we came back a few times and everything. We pretty much stayed on the road, and then we got the TV show, and Came out to L.A., and uh, it, was, it was a wonderful time when we were out here. And this was the Rob Brothers? Yeah. We were out here in the 60s and doing a TV show that shot five days a week, and it was any five days because it was all in location, so we couldn't go out and play. There was, there was no chance of even booking weekend gigs or something. And uh, we're over at the Dick Clark place sitting outside, and Dick comes out. And we're just sitting talking. We used to do that. He used to like to come and hang out and talk. And we're saying, you know, 
we're trying to figure out what to do. We're a band, we can't play. And he said, yeah, I knew this was going to come up. He said, yeah, he said, let me see what I can do. So he comes back the next day and says, I got you a gig. He said, well, I got you a house band, the Whiskey. And we said, way cool. So the Whiskey had three house bands and they'd overlap a night. So the three house bands were us, the Chambers Brothers and the Doors. And nobody had a record yet. That was the summer the Light My Fire came out. And then the same with the Chambers Brothers. And that, and it was just, it was an unbelievable time. It was just amazing. And it was, uh, it was a kinder, gentler time. I mean, Sunset Boulevard turned into like a carnival. Cars, they didn't block it off. They didn't have to. It was solid people. And, uh, you know, you'd sit out on the sidewalk in front of the whiskey with John Sebastian and stuff and the turtles and that kind of thing. And it was just really, it was, it was wonderful. It was all music and everybody was really supportive. Bands were supportive of each other. They'd say, you guys need a song. We're going we're gonna to look for a song for you. We're going to write you something. And that, very cool. So that went on. <clears throat> and after we went off the show, we uh, went out at the band again and decided to woodshed for a while. So we went back and rented a, a home way up in northern Wisconsin, and we were going to sit for a month or so and, you know, get our act together because it was pretty pop, the show was, and it wasn't exactly our image. So we came out with a nine-piece band with horns and everything. It was absolutely wonderful. And we took that out on the road and did that for probably another four years or so. And we always had uh, L.A. as the home base then. So we used to live at the Tropicana on the Santa Monica Boulevard, which is another story. It was, that's, <laughs> everybody stayed there. There was no place at 3 in the morning on a Saturday night like the pool at the Tropicana. It was the Jefferson Airplane and Steppenwolf and everybody lived there. So it was, it was wonderful. <clears throat> but we needed a home base, so we went and uh, rented a ranch out in Chatsworth. And... Dunhill was our label at that time, and uh, they, when we come off the road, they'd give us demo budgets to go in and cut demos of the songs that we've been writing on the road. And so, okay, and we come back one time, and we say, okay, we're back to cut demos. And they say, well, good news, uh, we've built a studio now, so, you know, you'll be able to do your demos here. And we said, great, um, when can we come in? Oh, three dog nights in for the next two months. We thought, okay, I see what they did. <laughs> No demo budgets. So we started to convert our barn. It was awesome. We, you know, we didn't have much of any money with that. And we'd go out and so we had a gig in uh, Hermosa Beach and we'd take that money and we'd buy what lumber we could and the rest of it would go to construction sites at night. And, you know, whatever we had to do. And we built the studio up there. And our friends from Dunhill, to make a long story short, uh, started to come out to the ranch. And it was pretty soon. And the group, oh, we changed the name of the group from Rob's to Cherokee at that point because we thought we needed a complete change. We got the ranch up and running and we're starting to get acts. And Del Shannon was uh, somebody that we'd known since the Dick Clark days and moved out there when we did and was a neighbor close, you know, within a mile or so of the ranch. And so he was always over there. We were building. So we were recording Dell. And then Brian Highland was a friend of Dell's would come out. But pretty soon, other people would start to show up at the ranch. And um, God, I had a list of them the other day, but it got, it got pretty amazing. Jeff Lynn came out. Uh, that was great. Little Richard came out. What year is this? What year? It must be 72, maybe, 73, somewhere in there. All of our acts, friends from Dunhill, Steely Dan came out and did an album. And um, oh, who else? Michael McDonald. Oh, Bob Crew. We started we started disco out there. Bob Crew did his first disco record with Monty Rock the Third. Was the Steely Dan record Pretzel Logic? Yeah. Yeah. And this was an MCI console? An MCI console and uh, an MCI 16 track we started with. And then Steely Dan, they needed more tracks, so the Roger brought out a 24 track. And at that point we had to have one. And it was it was going really well. Everything was going great. The ranch was, you know. People were showing up and they said, wow, we heard it was out here. We've been looking for the last hour to try and find it. We'd roll down the windows and see if we could hear anything. And it was like that. We were just, nobody knew where we were. So we're doing fine. But one morning we come down and they've chained the door shut on the ranch. And there's a thing that says uh, the cease and desist order and from the sheriff. And it appears that we're operating an illegal home studio. Now, we're out in Chatsworth in Box Canyon next to Spawn Ranch and places like this. 
And it was like, this is ridiculous. Well, it wasn't exactly that, but nonetheless, we, we lost the ranch. And after we left, the ranch continued on for 15 years at least. And uh, it pushed us into another situation where we found that MGM Records was for sale and the studio. Through a series of events and friends and getting help from people, we were able to buy it. And we went in with uh, Rick Nelson. We were producing Rick out at the ranch. And so we went in with him and got one of the studios on the air and kept going. And people would show up. Keith Moon shows up. And uh, that's also another story. <laughs> I think people would like to hear a Keith Moon story. Okay. <laughs> We're doing vocals with Rick. And we get a call that says, Keith Moon's at the front desk. He wants to see Rick. And Rick's going, oh, no. He said, we're not going to get the thing done. And he said, um, what can we do? Could somebody entertain him? We want it, we're, either you, D and I were doing it. And he said, could either you or your brother? And I said, I'll go hang with him and keep him out. And he said, okay. So anyway, I'm going to hang with Keith. And he's a fine fellow. And he suggests we go out and have a drink. I said, okay. And he's got... Um, the limo, I think, and the limo of Fleetwood, he's got that and he's got a driver that's been with him forever. And so we go out and his driver, which I didn't realize this was their standard thing they do when they get to a bar, uh, he'd run into the bugle and blast a few notes and Keith would run to the back of the trunk and put on some sort of costume. Sometimes he was a knight in armor, sometimes he was a soldier, it's whatever. And so... <laughs> You can see how this was going. So around a day and a half later, I've ended up in Santa Barbara and I get him to drop off at the airport so I could fly back, but I kept him out of the studio. But he was a fine fellow and he made me a Royal Order of the Moon with trumpet blasts and everything and I got my own <laughs> outfit. And it was, it was that kind of time. But so it's, it's you know, at that point, and I never, never saw Keith again after that. But uh, he was a great fellow. We actually, we had, we had a wonderful time and hangovers, a lot of that. We had a reputation building from the ranch and people started to find out about the studio and it just took off. We're sitting there and we get a call that uh, David Bowie's up front. And we walk out and uh, there's David, really, really nice person, genuinely nice person. He walks around the studio and goes over and plays a note on the piano and says, I'm going to do Max album here. So we start Stacey in the Station. Fantastic. And, oh, it was wonderful. And oh my God, so much talent. And I mean, and I never enjoy this kind of thing, but I've heard and I've gotten calls from magazines. GQ asked me to do a comment on an article or a book there, one of the guys was doing there at GQ. And so he wanted to ask me some questions about David. And he said, well, I understand that David was so high he doesn't remember doing the album. And I said, did you believe that? He said, well, I don't know. I'm asking you. I said, have you heard the album? And he said, yes, yeah, wonderful album. I said, how high could he have been and done that album? I said, you've got to be kidding. I said, I don't know why people enjoyed doing that, but no, he wasn't. Everybody got high then. It was that time. And uh, it was no big deal. But as far as being excessive, no, there's people that are excessive. David was together. And uh, while he's there, we're back. And I get a call and said, Frank Sinatra's up front. And we go, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and what we didn't realize is with MGM, we'd inherited their clients. And Sinatra and Don Costa was his uh, arranger and producer. Uh, Don used to work there a lot. And in fact, he'd owned the studio before it was MGM. So they cut all their Sinatra strings and his orchestra dates and the songs he'd do. So he books time and it's like, okay. And so anyway, they uh, come in. And all three of us are in the in studio on the room. And Don Costa comes in and says, all right. And Don is really uptight. He says, when he comes in, don't speak to him unless he speaks to you. And only call him Mr. Sinatra and don't ask him to do a mic check. <laughs> now, what I hadn't mentioned is that MGM was a straight and sober place with fluorescent lights everywhere, no drinking, no anything. No one could. So Sinatra was famous for coming in. The orchestra would be set up. And he said, I'm going to grab a drink. And he would go for two hours or more while the orchestra would sit there. And he was basically messing with the label because they wouldn't let him have a drink or anything. So it's, no, I'm going to have a drink. And so it would go that way. He was known for that. And he said, oh, he's difficult. 
he comes into the studio to the control room and uh, he says, so you're the new owners? And we said, yeah. He said, I heard your brothers. And we said, yeah, we are. And he said, uh, I like families. And at that point, Joe, middle brother, opens the door and rolls a bar cart in the control room. And he just, Sinatra lights up. So the is still sitting there and we sit around, we make a drink and um, suggest we have another. And Joe said, I'll make it. And he says, no, I'll make it. Apparently he didn't like Joe's drink. So <laughs> it was, anyway, we uh, sit for, I don't know how long, quite a while, 45 minutes or so with him telling his road stories. And as we got to realize, he was a musician like the rest of us and he had great road stories. And he liked to mess with, with the industry and the people that, uh, you know, the, the heads of the labels, that kind of thing. He was, he was famous for that. And in a way, I don't blame him. <laughs> you know, a lot of people would like to, but what are you going to do with Sinatra? And we became pretty good friends at that point. Uh, and he's intrigued with Bowie because you're with this young guy. So with Cherokee, we had one big lounge and it was really cool. Everybody hung out there. And anyway, I come out and they're sitting there and we'd introduce them and everything. And they become friends. And Bowie comes in and sings some on Sinatra's album. And uh, they became friends and they went out to dinner and everything. And it was just, it was just really cool because you're seeing Sinatra and Bowie at both at different ends of the scale and the timeline and everything. And so much in common. It was, it was wonderful. I mean, music has the ability to do that with people. It crosses age lines, race lines, everything. Uh, a lot of that never existed. So that was a great thing. So anyway, after that, it goes from one act to the other. And we now have three studios on the air, and the fourth studio, and we ended up with five studios and a, a big staff, nine full-time technicians, one point we had around 40 people on staff there because everybody had to have runners and we ran 24 hours a day. And what we did then is we'd run two sessions a day in the same room. Rod Stewart at the daytime and I can't remember who was coming in after him. Another actress would go like that and they'd have to break down and set up and everything. So we needed a lot of people to do it. But it, uh, it was something that a few studios were doing and Cherokee was always a little different. I mean, as you can see, we're, it's a little different here. It's about the vibe, and it's about making people comfortable and feeling creative. That's what makes great music. Studios weren't always a friendly, you know, inspiring place to be. Um, a lot of people didn't necessarily like the kind of music we were doing, and both studios had house engineers, and you just didn't feel inspired to go out and play. And we changed that as quickly as we could. We, we made the place to where it was really comfortable and friendly. Uh, it was a formula that worked to a point that a lot of other studios did that. And we were one of the first studios that didn't have house engineers. Uh, we had a second engineering staff that were all engineers. And they were there and they knew what their point there. Their point there was to make the engineer completely comfortable and no problems would come his way. If they see an 1176 going, you're going to have to tell them, match the thing and swap it quick. Get it in there and it never stops. And it got to the point where people could just sit back and do their music and not worry what was going on, which is what, you know, that's the way it should be. It's, it happens out there, not in here. So covering that, and we had a, we had a, nice, a nice image and relaxed mood to the whole studio. But it was also very tight, the tech department, the engineering department, and everything. And that's, that's how we lasted for that many years and did, you know, as many records as it, as it did. It, it was probably one of the coolest things to own. Jerk, it was absolutely incredible. You could have those nights where sometimes I'll wake up at 3 in the morning and it's like, I'm not going to go back to sleep. Should I go watch TV or should I go down to the studio? <laughs> 24 hours a day, it was great. So it, it was a very creative place. Um, acts got together and would write together and things. It was something that didn't go on many places. So Cherokee was, you know, uh, it was unique at that. So, you know, with only having second engineers and having house engineers, so many of the acts, and particularly the British acts, 
um, had their own engineers and they wanted to use their own engineers. But of course, when you went and you had house engineers and they were union studios, which, you know, they were RCA and Columbia and all of these places, um, you had to do it that way. And we didn't. We, we catered to the artists and the music. And there were a lot of people that um, didn't quite understand what we were doing. There were a lot of people that didn't like it. We, we had, you know, some flack, but in general, the reception to it was great. I think one of my old friends, Brian Colstrom, was in. You remember Brian? Yes. I think he was in. Was he? Did he assist for you? Is that how he yeah. came up? Yeah. Because he told me he was on a, he was on a Billy Idol record that went for about a year or something. Oh yeah. I can't remember. Well, we had we had a department there called Plant Operations, and we would bring people that had never been in studios before, and we would turn them into engineers, and some of them turned into super famous engineer. Joe Ciccarelli was, you know, going through a lot of people. Um, Barbara Streisand's engineers, there's tons of them. George Tutko, you know, between Rod Stewart and John Mellencamp and everything. But they go through plant operations and we'd bring them into the room, first teach them how to do setups and things like that. And then after a while they could go in and hang out with the second engineer that was in the room and learn it. And when they did that, we got a quality of person that our second engineers learned something that I don't see much anymore. But what we really, really pushed them for is we taught them how to listen. And when they did, that that does a lot of things. It shows the equipment, any problems that you're going to have, and it also can keep you, you know, in the, in the record-making process and the politics of a studio and what we can and can't do. And basically just supporting, supporting the act to where all the act and the producer had to think about was their music. Because I think one of the big things that made Cherokee as popular as it was with the artists on it. And uh, producers, mm, a lot of them loved it, but not everybody got it. Cherokee wasn't right for everybody. And I'll admit that. And um, it's, you know, it, it was people that were serious about doing their music and not something else, which, you know, in, in this industry, there's, there's a lot of those. So we dealt with, we dealt with those for years and it came out, I think, definitely to the positive. Uh, where Cherokee came apart was when the technology changed where labels were actually coming into the sessions and telling people like, look, uh, They've got Pro Tools now, and uh, so what we will do is we will guy, buy you guys a set of Pro Tools, and you can go and do your overdubs and stuff like that at home, and it was happening with a lot of bands. And as people started opening up home studios, because not everybody was capable of doing that. And it kind of devastated the rates and everything out for studios, but it was, they would say, well, see, you can do this for much cheaper. Well, there's other things that you miss. Um, one of the things that you miss like that is stuff like this. And the stuff like this, you say, well, I mean, you know, there's, there's a difference, but it's not that important. Well, it is. And it's important, in fact, not just how it sounds, but in the way that you produce. When you have things like this and you're analog or whatever, if you're doing it that way, you'll produce differently. When you, when you have, you know, the ability to make something that sounds great instead of having to do four guitars. If you do Run the White Way, it's like, okay, that's cool. And suddenly you've got these great sounding records. And then all of a sudden we're dealing with the, the wall, the flat wall of Pro Tools. It's not Pro Tools that's the problem. The people that could do that is anybody that could operate it would, you know, could declare themselves an engineer or a producer. And it takes a while to learn to do that. It takes a while to learn how to get into the act that you're producing and everything. So, that was something that definitely impacted the studio. It impacted a lot of studios in LA. And then we got into, uh, you know, the collapse, the economic the real estate collapse and everything, and a lot of studios disappeared. Uh, we were one of them. And it disappeared because it was not terribly rewarding anymore for one thing. Uh, there was a huge monthly nut to the place and they say, well, I can get so-and-so's bedroom for, you know, $300 a day. Well, I think you should. <laughs> I mean, what else can you do? So that was kind of what happened with that. And my brother was getting sick at that time. And so we stepped out of it, studio, and 
<clears throat> my partner Tiffany and I went out and uh, decided that we were going to go on with it and carry on. And we had several different plans, but one of the things that we did was we, you know, when we went out, I said, no, we're not selling the equipment. We're keeping as much as we can. And already quite a bit of it had left. As you can see, there's still quite a bit of it, all we need. Um, so we started down that road and we, you know, two or three different places we got involved. One of them, we actually had it pretty well built out. And then we found this place and we walked away from the other one and started building here. And it was a long build and I actually never intended to build anything this complicated again after Cherokee, but I'd had, I'd had some breathing time and rested up. And so we got into this and with George Oxberger's help and some other fine people that came in here and assisted us and helped us build it and everything, um, we've got another Cherokee Studios. And I think, um, I think it lives up to everything Cherokee was. It's, it's, one of the, it's one of the things that the benchmark was set kind of high. One of the things that Cherokee was known for was, boy, how come those great records come out of there? Well, because <laughs> it's easier to make records there. You want to. Makes you want to play it. Makes you want to write. So hopefully, um, as we come out of the pandemic, we're going to be back there again. And, uh, you know, as I was saying earlier to you, music I see starting to change a little bit. I'm seeing some new acts. I'm seeing some younger acts that are writing and playing well. And uh, this, you know, this is something that the industry needs. It needs it needs some great music and some great songs. It's interesting. When I first got an e email, you know, talking about Cherokee and, oh, you should come by and check it out, I wasn't sure. I was thinking, is it somebody that bought the name? You know what I mean? was the first reaction. <laughs> Because there was that gap of a yeah. few years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's wonderful to hear that you uh, you're just carrying on the legacy, and that you still have the A range. Yeah, the A range and every everything here is is all from Cherokee, including the doors and the control room windows and everything. We and the vibe. We've brought the vibe with us. So that's uh, that's our plan. What are we going to do? What we did before, and that was just the music. It wasn't the it wasn't the era. It wasn't you know this style of music it's it's not the it's not the styles or the genres or anything else it's doing the music that you understand and when you finish a project that you truly like that record as long as you can do that whether it sells or not well not all of them do but when i the records i make uh i try to do things that i really like and when they're done i play them Play them a lot. They're what I think they're think they're good, and I think as long as you know, as long as I can do that, we can keep uh, going on here. And we're starting to get, you know, now that the pandemic is opening up, we're starting to get uh, outside producers and engineers and things like that coming in. And so this is something that should have started, you know, a year and a half ago, but uh, the brakes have been put on everything. So however long it takes to come out of this, we'll we'll be here. So what are you what are you working on currently? Well. During during the uh, whole pandemic and shutdown, there's been a lot of spare time on our hands. So, uh, you know, there's so many cool things going on, and we're you know we're watching YouTube and seeing a lot of music stuff and interesting stuff. But we kind of saw there's uh, there's room for more. There's room for other things, but we're looking for different things. So we've got a YouTube channel that we're working on. There's a couple of different shows. One of them that came up that we talked about for a long time. That's kind of, we got the idea from Rebecca Cherokee. When, when Cropper was out cooking and our, we didn't have a kitchen. It was a hot plate and stuff. And they're out there. And while we're cooking, Heather James comes in. Says, what you guys doing? And Cropper said, I'm making black and red fish. And I said, Ooh, that's great. He said, tomorrow I'm making gumbo. And Cropper or Edda says, you ain't making gumbo. I'll make gumbo. So she comes in, and we're sitting out there, and there's a bottle of wine. Cropper's got the acoustic and the strum in playing, and Edda's you know, slapping us with the spoon. Don't touch that. Stuff like that. And it was like, this would have been a great cooking show. This would have been awesome. So what, what we're doing, and Tiffany's hosting this, uh, is our artists come in. Scott, where is Scott? He's out there somewhere. Scott's one of them. And they cook and it's uh it's in, you'll you you have to see it they cook and it's you know with all cooking shows there has to be glasses of wine or mimosas or something like that and it goes like that and then they come in here and scott plays his one of his songs he's just written 
and that. And it's uh, it's good because a lot of the stuff they're talking about is current stuff, music stuff, and things non-related to the industry at all. And it's just, it's, you know, it's entertainment. And it's, it's good to see. And as we've discovered, is every, every star has a dish that they cook. I think Jeff Beck, I, it's a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches, the best in the world, but they've all got things that they cook. So come in and cook something, then we'll play. Do you have Jeff doing that? No, not yet. We're just getting to this as our first thing. They're, they're just going out. That's what we're working on tonight after this. I got a session. I'm English, so it's, it's curry or beans on toast. <laughs> <laughs> That's something. We're, we're excited about that. It's coming out good. I mean, we're, we're seeing the footage, and it's just being edited now, so we'll have that out pretty quick. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's time for things like that. We'll put a link down below. So you can click down below. Bruce Fingers, Rob? Oh, wait a minute. Is, 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 there a, is that you? I hope not, but it must be. <laughs> Bruce I Fingers, never had a nickname. <laughs> well, let me read um, the credit. How about... It says Donovan, Lady of the Stars. Yes, we did that. Well, apparently you, you are Bruce Fingers, Rob. This is the uh, first I'm hearing. <laughs> from Lady of the Stars, where you have a Wurlitzer credit in 1983. Okay, I could have done that. Well, although I've got several credits, I got the wonderful credit and a lot of congratulations for my guitar work on Damn the Torpedoes. Oh, well, so you must know Shelly then. Oh, very well. I know Jimmy. Shelly and Jimmy camped out at Cherokee when they first got here from New York for months and they were there for a long time. But but so I all the guitar work I did in the Damn the Torpedoes, the only problem is I don't play guitar. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't pulled the credits, so... So what, were, what, what did you do on the record that they were crediting you for? Um, I, I did some engineering, not much, days when Shelly wasn't there to get there. But Shelly and, Shelly and Jimmy were doing that. I didn't do much. They came over with a couple things, with a couple vocals that we did. They were doing most of that at uh, A&M at the time. And, uh, you know, it was, it was amazing. And the next time, it, and Tom was, was, you know, had an incredible crew, an incredible, you know, studio and his engineers and their producers and everything and he had this going for him so we didn't see much of him until we uh did warren zevon's last album hmm. and that was that was interesting it was like when that was booked in i'm kind of going oh man this is going to be hard um we had so much fun warren was so great he was not hiding from anything. And he said, I'm going to have a lot of fun while we're doing this. And he said, you are too. And it was like, wow. So everybody was there and Tom Petty came back and uh, it was, that was great. We saw a lot of people who we hadn't seen for a while. And it was so, it was so great to see the way that Warren did this. I, I had, I still do I have so much respect for him. Tell us some, tell us something about John Belushi. We did a movie and I think, I think it was the great outdoors and John had found this punk band and he was really taken by them and uh, the band was fear and so he says no no I, we, we got to do this we're going to do this and said fine great bring them in and they really hadn't been in the studio much they hadn't had the ability and, and bands like that didn't make really enough and there weren't you know, those weren't days of home studios, so it was tough to get anything done. But anyway, they they come in, Spit and Tooth and Dirk and Lee, <laughs> everybody, and they get all their stuff set up, and they haven't recorded, and they haven't really worn headphones or anything like that much. So the film, so here's what here's what we should do, guys. Play your set. Play it top to bottom, don't stop, just like you're doing a show. Pretend you're doing a show. Same energy and all that. Just crank it up from you make a mistake. Don't worry about it. Don't stop. So they say, okay. So they start out and they get about four songs into it and uh, they stop. The cropper says, guys, what happened? They said, wait a minute. And he leaving, turns to the guitar player and says, you missed the solo in that song. He said, no, I didn't. He said, well, you didn't play a solo. He says, there is no solo in that song. He <laughs> said, yes, there is. And so they're going back and forth like that. And he says, wait a minute. He reaches over and picks up his song list. He said, this is the wrong song list. They've played four songs all the way through and they're playing off different song lists. So they never noticed because it was, it was punk. <laughs> it was so that was absolutely great. So we go through and we get, we get the stuff done. Neighbors, that was the movie with uh, Aykroyd and Belushi where they're 
fear and loathing neighbors. And uh, we finished the soundtrack, and I forget how many how many songs we had in it. And uh, Belushi is doing everything he can to get it in front of, was Al Teller the president of MCA then? Probably. I think so. He tried to get it to Al Teller. Spend a million to make a million, Al Teller. Yep, absolutely. And Belushi is just, you know, he was Belushi all the time. And that included all, like, drugs and everything that went with it. And he was having a wonderful time. There's no doubt about it. He had too much fun. But uh, he would go in the middle of the night and bribe the guard to let him into the MCA building. And he'd go and he'd sleep in front of Al Teller's door so Al Teller would have to step over him to get into his office so then he could go and sell the group on him. And he didn't, Al Teller didn't want to do this. But anyway, they get, they get the stuff in the movie. And the band is just peaking. They're, they're so excited they can't, they can't believe it. And they're, they're thrilled about it. And uh, Belushi then insists that he's now a semi-regular on Saturday Night Live. He's stepped out of the that show and he once every two weeks or something. So he tells them, either you bring fear on with me or I'm done. And I'm going, all right, you can have the band on. So he brings the band to Saturday Night Live and with what fear does best most punk bands, and that's why they were so revered by all of their fans, um, they totally trashed the set in the green room while the show was going on. They're crashing things, beating them with their guitars, tipping everything over, and it's complete mayhem. They didn't expect this. And people are going nuts. And the CEO of the network calls and said, throw the breaker. Go to black. Get this off. He's completely freaked out. So <laughs> there's nothing we can do about it. Everybody, Belushi, he doesn't care. Fear is thrilled because now they're banned from his ABC. They're banned for life. They can never <laughs> go on ABC again. So it's another first for them. And uh, so they... Pull the movie. It's already in theaters. They pull the movie and take our entire soundtrack off it, which has also never been done. That's the first. Congratulations again to Fear. They pull the <laughs> entire soundtrack off it and put score on it, which is the wrong movie for score. And about two or three years ago, I think, I don't know, um, I get a call from Lee. And he says, Bruce, he said, you're not going to believe this. He said, next week is the release. They're re they're having a re-release of Neighbors, and they put our soundtrack back on. I said, you know, if you just wait a little, it comes around. <laughs> he said, 15 years? <laughs> it's like, well, sometimes it takes time. But uh, they, their fear was amazing. They were, uh, they were completely uninhibited about everything. But the thing about them is punk was very, punk is, is a form of expressing mostly anger. And it is. It's at uh, Henry Rollins is another group of who worked with and recorded them. And Henry was saying that. He said it's it's not singing. He said it's expressing the emotion. A lot of the emotion is anger about a lot of what's going on. He said, it's, he said they can't sing. We're not trying to sing. And it's like okay. And uh, you know they managed to do it, but they also managed to be having so much fun while they were doing it that it was really it was a treat to watch them. Even tipping amplifiers and tables and stuff over. It was just you couldn't get mad at them, but the network did. So anyway, that <laughs> that was the that was the fear story with Belushi, and uh, he passed away very shortly after that. And that, but we we'd also done uh, we did Dragnet with uh, Dan, and we did Blues Brothers stuff and things like that. And it was. Uh, did you do much of the recording on Blues Brothers? Um. A little, a little, because they were mostly out of New York and Cropper would bring stuff out and we'd do it because Cropper lived out here. So uh, that was that was a fun thing that went on for years. And Aykroyd became a, became a regular over there. He came in one time when we were building our mix room and uh, comes in and looks at the work and everything. He said, okay. And so I come in for our session. He said, oh, um, Dan got here about three hours ago. And I said, well, didn't you know what time of session? He said, yeah. He said he'd be over in Studio 2. So I go over and there he is, and he's got his carpenter's belt on, and his saws and everything, because he was a carpenter. And he loved it, so he'd come in every day and help him build the studio. <laughs> it's like, okay. They were, they were interesting guys. Um, every now and then, it's been a while, every now and then I still see Danny. 
and uh, it's wonderful. It's it's like you know we're sake we just talked a week ago, and that so that's cool. Um, what other what other oh, things? Levon, Levon Helm. Yes. Levon Helm. This is a quick one. Right, first time I never met Levon before, and uh, Cropper's down in the studio, and I was up in my office. He, I was waiting for them to go because I had everything up and running. And so uh, he said, Bruce, come on down. Levon's here. And I said, great. So I head down and I'm going back into Studio 3. And as they go back in, there's a door to the, to like a loading dock out there. And the door of Studio 3 flies open and a guy runs out with one of those great big coffee urns, silver ones, and throws all the coffee out in the uh, alley. And I'm thinking, what am I watching here? And he goes back in, sets it up, and gets a bottle of sake about that tall and fills the coffee machine with it so it'll keep it hot. And I'm thinking, that must be Levon. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see the tone of the session from there. And a lot of sessions were like that. Sometimes art and talent are fueled by things like this. And uh, whether it's unfortunate or not, then it didn't seem that way for Levon. We were having a great time. It was a great record. And that, that was a really fun thing to do. And we also discovered that when we do, we discovered it early on, we have him sing a guide track. And we'd get an RE20 and just tell him, just eat that microphone and sing quiet. And because uh, the guys need a guide vocal and he, you know, he's playing all the time. And then we go to do the vocal and it was like, Wait a minute. <laughs> then we go back and play the guide vocal. The difference was unbelievable. His inflections, it was like the best singing I've ever heard when he's playing. It's that way with a lot of musicians. And, uh, you know, when you, when you do that in front of this, like, whoa, this changes things. <laughs> and uh, I think we went back and recut several of the tracks on it because it just having him sing and play was just amazing. He's in, and he is one of my favorite artists. I, I love Levon. Good person, everything. Great actor. I love the stuff he did. He's a coal miner's daughter. That was a great one. Shelley told me the uh, same story about Levon on uh, Music from the Big Pink. He said that the, there's some songs where the drums are on one track because they, they gave up trying to separate vocals and drums. That There's, there's a vocals and drums are on the same track. Wow. <laughs> wow. But a lot of those tracks were on four track. Oh, man. Yeah. So, um, so t t you, you've got a long association with Steve Cropper. Oh, he's the real thing. He's the real thing. One night we're, this, this is a good thing about songwriting. You'll know, like this. One night we're, uh, I don't know who we were working on. One of, one of the things that we did, but it was about two in the morning. And Cropper goes, oh, damn, Bruce. He said, uh, we got to stop for a minute. I said, what's wrong? He said, I totally forgot. Um, I've got to, I've got to do the Tonight Show in about an hour. And he looks at his thing. He said, I would have missed it completely. And you don't do that. He said, uh, we got to go out there. And that's when the Tonight Show, I don't know if they still do, but they shoot around the clock and do a week's worth of shows in several days. And they changed, they changed Jeff and things like that. And, you know, uh, whoever was the... Whoever was the host of the show would get some sleep there, but it was a it was a real grinder, real mill. We cranked them out. So uh, we go out, and the show's about songwriting, and this is great. <laughs> there, and they say at two in the morning, we're in pretty good shape here. We've been in recording, so we go out, and they've got three different sets of songwriters, and Barry and Cynthia Mann are out there, and I'm trying to remember who the other songwriters were, and then Cropper. And uh, Barry and Cynthia and the other songwriters start, and they ask, they ask them, how did Barry and Cynthia, how do you write songs? And um, Cynthia says, it'll, it'll start with Barry, and it may start with the piano riff, and we'll keep the shirt. And he may work on it for two or three weeks, and he flushes it out, and he's got verses and choruses, and it becomes a complete song. And he said, at that time, he'll give it to me, and then I will go away for however long, two weeks to a month and write words and the lead vocals and get all that. And then we come back and we wrestle it out. We fight it out and critique each other's work and we put it together and we come out with the finished song. And I'm going, wow, I mean, even a song you've had, you know, 20 number one records. And uh, so that's amazing. And so it goes like that and they're talking and they get the cropper. And 
They say, well, how do you write songs, Cropper? And Cropper's sitting there on the couch and he's got his Telecaster with him. I don't know why, <laughs> but he's sitting there. And he said, well, back in Memphis when I was a little feller, Ducky Dunn and I lived across the train track from Sears and Roebuck. And they had the bookstore there and they had a book there and it said, play guitar by the dots. And so I got the book and I learned to play guitar by the dots. And, uh, you know, that's uh, how, I'd, how I'd do things. And he said, for instance, and I decided we're going to write a song. So I'd start with this top dot. And you'd say, dum, 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 dum. You've got to wait for the midnight hour. You know, oh boy. And then he said, well, the next song I wrote, I'll start with the bottom dots. And dum, dum, dum. And uh, it's knock on wood. <laughs> read the song. And there now, you can see everybody's faces, they're kind of sick with it. It's like, oh no. <laughs> we were fighting it out, and he's got to play guitar by the dots, and he's written 21 top 10 records. Thing. And he, you know, and Dock in the Bay and all that stuff. And uh, it, was, it was really eye-opening, because that's the difference. And there's no wrong way to do this. None at all. It's, it's wonderful, but it's great. It's great when you see the kind of the kind of difference between constructing songs, which is an art, and only people who know how to do that, and what just comes out of you on that. And Cropper is definitely all feel and just what comes out. He said the song he labored the longest on was uh, the song 6345789. And uh, I love that song. Great song. And he said it was fine, but he said I spent a week writing down numbers to come out with a number combination that you could sing that would sound good. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's a little different than play by the dots, but <laughs> that was cool. So we did a lot of stuff. We did uh, John Cougar Mellencamp's first album, first hit album. When we were doing John's album, I think that was Nothing Matters and What If It Did. I think that was the name of it. And uh, we didn't have the budget. To, to really do it the way it should be. And, and labels were cutting stuff and John was a new artist and nobody knew if they liked him, believe it or not. In fact, nobody from the label ever showed up for that entire album. But uh, they give us what appears to be we got to get all the tracks in two days or so, basics. And Kenny really hasn't ever been in the studio before. And he's never listened to a click track or anything like that. and he was having trouble with it. And we spent an hour or two on the first song. And when he could finally lock into the tempo, his feel was gone. And Kenny's feel is incredible. It's unbelievable. And Cropper said, Bruce, what are we going to do? We can't afford this. We're not going to get this record finished. And they're, they're going to cut it. And, and he said, I think we better bring Kenny in and tell him we're going to have to use another drummer. We get Rick Slosser, who was Van Morrison's drummer, and uh, Rick comes in, and so Kenny's really bummed, and he said, well, I, I may as well go. And Carver said, no, you may as well stay. He said, Kenny, sit down here with us for the whole time and just watch this. And he did. He stayed, and I just didn't have an opportunity or reason to, to, to see him. They were touring all the time. They were recording back there. So I didn't see Kenny for years. And I run into him and uh, he says, hey, you fired me. And I said, yeah. And he said, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. He said, I learned so much. I can't believe it. I wouldn't be where I am. He said, I didn't understand what, you know, first of all, about the, the tempo and the stuff like that. And he said, and also most of all the dynamics. The dynamics split was because Slosser, you know, recording dynamics and live dynamics are so different, it's unbelievable. And you can do it, but once you do that, you have the feel. It takes it takes time. It just takes doing a lot of it. And uh, he's my favorite drummer. That guy's unbelievable. He's I, a I shame. love him. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I thought that was funny because first I was like, oh no, he hates me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it can, that was great. Quick one. We're in Nashville doing one of our first records, and you've got. Uh, Harmonica Fats book to come in and play. And they uh, get going and he, he arrives a little late and so he goes in and sits down in his chair and you come out and give him the sheet music and looking at it. And they go in and start to play and looking and they're saying, uh, what's the matter, Fats? I can't, uh, do you not read music? And he says, Sid, I can't even read writing. <laughs> <laughs> and then he played his harmonica solo. 
Oh my God. So that was, yeah, no, I love that. That was, that's one of the best things I heard. So tell us a little bit about Harry Nielsen. Harry was a really, really interesting, and as far as I'm concerned, a really good person. I had a wonderful time with Harry, and the album went on for well over a year. It was an album that only came out in England because he got into this thing with United, and it came out, it was called Fast Harry. And it had, uh, oh, a lot of people on it. Um, I think John Lennon did some stuff on it. Everything and uh, it was awesome. We we recorded for like I'm saying over a year, and then we took a break in the middle of it. And uh, Harry and I did all the music for Popeye, and that was really fun. But uh, you know, Harry was a, one of the stories. Is uh, let me tell you a couple quick ones. Um, the guy from you from United was going to say uh, gets uh, bounced because there's been some questionable things with money disappeared so the ceo is is gone and uh we're about three months into the album and we're still on basic tracks <laughs> so, you know we we were going wide open too but anyway uh they want us to come over and uh explain ourselves to the temporary ceo who's a young guy and a uh, little bit high pressure a little bit young too for this in 20s but he had a nice suit and uh, anyway, so Harry's comes in and he said, uh, well, you know, let me have this records. And Harry said, I don't know why I'm here. He said, we've only got basic tracks. There's not even vocals on some of these. But uh, he said, I, I can hear past all that. Let me hear it. So we give him a cassette and he plays it in the office there and he stops the cassette and says, you know, Harry, I expected to hear lime in the coconuts, and I don't hear no lime in the coconuts here. And uh, we're pretty far into this on budget, so uh, what, what are you going to do? And Harry says, lime in the coconuts. Okay, um, how far am, am I? How far into it? Oh, we're about $140,000 or more. And he says, no, how far into it? He said, about, and he said, no, exactly. And he said, well, I have to call bookkeeping. Call bookkeeping. So he calls bookkeeping, it's 143,000 or something. And uh, Harry says, okay, and it's like this, and pulls out his checkbook, $143,000, and he says, there, now you don't have to hear lime in the coconuts. Bye, <laughs> we walk out. And I thought, I've never seen anything like that. That was amazing. So Harry, Harry would do, he'd do amazing things. He could, I mean, and, and it was, you know, I don't know whether it was the smartest movie made because they alienated uh, the label a bit. And that, and it was a really good album. There was some great stuff on it. But, uh, you know, Harry was going to do things his way, and he always did. And Harry was a very, very, he was a brilliant guy. How was the, uh, the Lemonheads record? Oh, we did, it was great. We did uh, gold albums with them, one after the other. It was their first one. When, they, when we got the Lemonheads, they sent us, and this is cool, they sent us a copy of their last record they did, and... It was a thrash record and thought, well, okay, maybe I don't understand thrash. I don't know, but I, I don't know that I could really do much for you on this. I don't know if there's anything we could do. And then he was in Australia at the time and he'd gone out to his, and was staying with his friend and he went out with his boom box to the kitchen and he'd played, he'd just written two songs. One was called Drug Buddy and the other was called It's a Shame About Ray. And he sends me the cassette and I go, whoa, I want to do this. Yeah. He is another great writer. Evan's an incredible writer. I think it's been fantastic. Well, it yeah. has. It has. Yeah. I really enjoyed this. I mean, Thank you I'm, so much. I'm a huge fo follower of yours, really. I love your stuff. I, I, I love everything you've done, so feelings are mutual. Oh, great. Great. <laughs>